So hello everyone, welcome to Life with Patty Boule. Well you know I always have the best guests on my program. I love doing this and today we are here at the offices of the Order of St. John with Surgeon Rare Admiral Lionel Jarvis CBE. He was consultant radiologist. He was the Surgeon General of the Royal Navy, Assistant Chief of the Defense Staff for Health and he served as the Royal Navy's Chief Medical Officer and Med Medical Director General. And he is now the Prior of the Priory of England and the Island of the Most Venerable Order of St. John. And he is also Chairman of St. John Ambulance. My goodness, that was a mouthful, but that is because Lionel has done everything. Now, we are here to talk about his life. I just want you to feel his spirit, his soul, and then we'll talk about all the wonderful, amazing work he has done with such passion and enthusiasm. Whoa, Lionel. What an introduction. I know. Thank you. My goodness. You know, as I was doing that, I'm thinking, good heavens, Lionel has done everything. I've, I've known you a while now as chairman of St. John Ambulance. And you have such great values. Um, your Christian values, apart from the fact that you met the Pope. Sorry, I'm so jealous about that. I was trying not to mention that, but I have to mention it. And so when I saw you today, I'm afraid I bowed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seriously, Lionel. I want to talk about your childhood. What kind of childhood did you have? Was it happy? Was it... Okay, that's interesting. I was brought up um, in a traditional, probably quite wealthy background. Mm -hmm. A beautiful home by the banks of the Thames. Okay. Fairly comfortably off family. And sent away to private school, boarding school from about the age of eight. Oh. So, happy, it's difficult to know. Exactly. Um, it was in those days um, a moderately austere times Dickensian environment, all boys, and uh, early term times were rather sparse, seeing your parents for a brief weekend respite once in three months was hardly the link to maternal and paternal bonding, mm -hmm. and it depends upon the family. So a very lovely family, but um, I don't think it really developed the close bonding between and within a family that uh, one would necessarily desire. Well, it, you know, I mean, sorry to interrupt there, but people, you know, you hear people say, oh, he, you know, had privileged lifestyle. I always say to people, until you walk in somebody's shoes, you know, be careful what you wish for. Well, it's a privilege, and I know that some families move on very well with this sort of uh, private education, I felt that it didn't help the bonding within the family. And certainly when I brought up my own children. Yes. Um, I didn't want to send them to private education. Actually, I had that opportunity as being a naval officer. Yeah. And boarding school education was there to allow us to maintain the continuity of education. And so here I am in my life and I have not spent a lot of time uh, in close contact with my Your previous parents. generation, parents, mm -hmm. my father died when I was relatively young. Mm -hmm. But um, my children, son and daughter, did very well, local schools, professionally very successful, went away, did their business, and they actually both now have come back and live in the adjacent village to our village, and that they're in the village that they grew up in. That's fantastic. Both so kids, you created a close family unit. Indeed, with their spouses mm -hmm. and their children. And so it's a large family gathering, and I think it's ended up being very successful. Who can ever say whether a private education is the right thing for any individual? Thank you. I was just about to say that because everyone's journey mm. is different. Mm. Everyone's journey. And whatever you go through when you are young prepares you for what's about to happen in the future. Did you have any siblings? I have a twin brother. But a twin? Yes. There's two of you hanging around. There is a twin. Uh, you might not have known that. 
<laughs> uh, you might not all say no, that it was probably unusual by the mid-1950s that my father had been married five times. He also had <sighs> an extraordinary life, so I have siblings from his other oh, okay. wives who are half-brothers and half-sisters, some of whom I became very close to. I have a twin brother, and he lives in Vancouver, so I don't see much of him. Either. Oh my goodness. So how many other step-brothers and sisters? There were four of us. Okay. All right, mine was 14. Yes, well... Um, I outrank you there. You do indeed. Daddy was busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine was busy with wives, yours was busy, busy with children. With children. <laughs> well, um, what inspired you when you were growing up, when you were a child? I think I've always been someone quite high energy and wanting to get on with life, get maximum out of it, probably even as a small child. And I think my my parents, my early school teachers probably said the same. So high energy myself, my father was very similar. I was very fond of him and admired him immensely. He was an extraordinarily successful entrepreneur himself. That drove me and people in his circle, men who were successful, inspired me to want to be the same, I think. So you had lots of people inspiring you. That's quite lucky actually, because some people just have, um, well, I would say for me, it was my family members. I had no outside forces that I thought I could look up to. I mean, there were many, but it's just money didn't allow that. You had a very different complex upbringing, as I know, because I read your book. <laughs> oh, oh, drat! <laughs> I've forgotten that. Amazing. I've forgotten that. But you know, so you, you know what I mean. It's when I when people say uh, bringing up being brought up in Africa was difficult. Yes, it was difficult, but it did prepare me for, for the life that I live. Just like you being sent to boarding school also prepared you. I think the shame is, you know, like my husband, is the not really getting to know your family. But on the other hand, there's a blessing to it in everything in life. But You're you also, positive. But you also acquire a different method of bonding with people. It's a strength. And you acquire a different but very strong education. Lots of opportunities out of that too. I like the, the fact that you said, you know, um, bonding with people because being in the Navy and with all the things that you have done, the, would you say that that created a discipline, um, respect, consideration for others? Because that's what I read in you I think all the times I um, met you. Discipline, of course, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's one of the armed forces. Mm -hmm. Consideration for others is absolutely fundamental. I didn't spend much of my career away at sea, but you do know as a young officer in the Royal Navy that it's absolutely critical to get on with living with other people. I would you say develop so. that ability to understand and know people in close proximity very powerfully. Boarding school does that too. Yes, it does. Because I went to boarding school and I think, okay, I was the seventh of nine children, so I had all my, I, I've done my society before I even came into yes, into the world. So, so you does. did you did society all your life, oh, quite yes. honestly. Oh. <laughs> you know, from, from what I know about you and your background that I've just introduced, you've done society all your life, which is probably why you are now the prior of the priory of the most venerable order of St. John. It's not a small thing to take on because as a surgeon, you it, it means that you continue to be a surgeon but in a different way. Yes, thank you for saying that. Because, so mid-career I moved from being a clinical consultant radiologist I was seduced by the ideas of senior command and responsibility and I was extraordinarily promoted to take on significant roles. And people used to say to me, don't you miss practicing medicine? I said, ah, oh, you don't understand. I practice medicine every day. Decisions that I'm making mm -hmm. based upon my career that influence a wider spectrum of delivery of healthcare. I may not clinically see patients, but I'm still practicing medicine using that experience. 
I'm going to say that I go to, when I go to Buckingham Palace or to a theatre or to wherever, what do you see? You see St. John Ambulance. Yes. Everywhere. Sometimes we don't even take notice of them. I always make a point of going to say hello to them because I have to confess that with the lessons that we had in schools in Africa from St. John, which they used to come maybe once a month, I learned how to deliver babies and ended up delivering my own grandson, who was the 10th baby I had delivered. Um, I have lost touch with first aid, so I am going to make that correct this year by going to St. John as a volunteer. Um, I want to talk to you about St. John now. If you could give me the history, because it's an incredible history okay. of St. John Ambulance and how it began today? Well, of course, um, I could give you a thousand year history. I know. I go through all of that. <laughs> Just give me the, the good bits. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, we, you, you introduced me as the prior of the Order of St. John. Mm -hmm. This is an order of chivalry of the British crown, whose history dates back to the 11th century, with check stops and starts. And it was, uh, there was a massive priory supporting the order based in this very building. So part of this estate is still unchanged since uh, the crypt was conceived and consecrated in the 12th century. And that was the Order of St. John that was supporting the Crusades in the Holy Land. The Order of St. John founded in the Holy Land in the end of the 11th century supported by a Catholic Church throughout Europe. So I won't go into the long history that took the Knights from the Holy Land to uh, Rhodes and then to Malta, eventually defeated by Napoleon in Malta in 1797. But before that, Henry VIII had abolished the Catholic order in England. And this gatehouse here, which we're in, mm -hmm. which was built in uh, around 1504, was sacked by Henry VIII, the whole palace here, in 1543. But the order continued throughout Europe. And being ready to adapt to change, those who retained a support and interest in the work of the order, which whose, whose motto has not changed for a thousand years, pro fide, pro utilitate hominum, for the faith and for the service of mankind. There was a recognition for a need to support those injured and maimed in industrial Victorian England and in the mines. And so in around the 1870s, those interested people established a first aid service to treat people around the country for their injuries, the first national health service. And they determined that patients should be moved from A to B and designed what was called an ambulance, a litter on wheels, and the original ones are still here, that you took patients from their point of injury, point of wounding, to a definitive point of care, first aid, in an ambulance, and it was called the St. John Ambulance, and it became the St. John Ambulance Brigade, and that was founded itself, and the modern Protestant order, which spread throughout the British Commonwealth. We're now a global humanitarian charity in 41 countries, teaching first aid, supporting people in their communities, and we have an eye hospital supporting the people of Palestine in the Holy Land uh, to this day. So we are spread throughout the world and 140 years on, we are a major healthcare charity, not only in the UK, but around the world. Well, around the world, yeah, that certainly affected my childhood. Yes, and I was actually very shocked to find out that St. John was not teaching first aid in all the schools in the UK. That came as a shock to me. And you and I discussed it when we first met and there was yes. a campaign going. And since that time, the government has now introduced laws that actually require first aid to be taught in schools. So our campaign succeeded and we have now done what you were doing in Nigeria Absolutely. early in your life. And in England, we are now mandated to treat, teach first aid in schools, which is wonderful success. That's because brilliant. it saves lives. It gives everyone who learns first aid a self-confidence 
to treat and help anyone that they see in their vicinity. Family members, yes. we see youngsters who save fathers' lives, we see parents who save the lives of their choking children, we see life saved on the street in the countryside. And it makes a difference. You celebrate this in Everyday Heroes, which yes. is how we met, because I was invited to one of these events. It's incredible. Some of the moving stories on Everyday Heroes, it's amazing. Because you think, if I was to fall or faint, which I did when I was pregnant with my first child in the underground, I'd like to know there's somebody there who knows what to do. But instead, in those days, everyone just walked over you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what they did. And so, it's you know, I want to talk about your volunteers, especially the young people, because when I presented the prize, it was to a 15-year-old that saved her father's life. And if that is not an advert <laughs> to spread St. John round the country, then nothing else is. She was only 15. Her father, I think, had a cardiac arrest mm -hmm. and she saved his life. Mm -hmm. And with such calm, such ease, I mean, the training. See, I want to use this when we've talked about you, now the work that you're doing. I want to spread this round about the, the life-saving skills that you give to young people, but it's not just the skills, the confidence as well. That's the important thing. It the, the first aid is our principal mm -hmm. educational arm, but it's more than that. This is a youth or young people's based organisation. Um, and we encourage youngsters to become part of us. Whether it's the young badgers from the age of currently seven, we're reducing it, um, who learn about community life, they learn skills that they will use the rest of their lives. Whether it's the cadets during their teens, and you've heard from some of these people I know, so oh, I, I see them all the time. These are youngsters who often, from difficult and challenging backgrounds, find an avenue for their skills and style and ambition and drive. They become part of a community. They are volunteering. They work and live as volunteers with other people. They learn so much that gives them a confidence for their future life. Some come and do this because it gives them an opportunity to then get into medical or nursing school. And many of them come during their teens, they might continue at university, they might stop, they come back as adults. And so we have a thriving community of tens of thousands of badgers and cadets throughout the country. This is a fundamental part of their lives. And my goodness, I love seeing those youngsters. They are just the best in society and we help them to bring out the best in themselves. I agree with you, because when we were in Windsor, I met some young, you know, one young girl, I think she's 17, said that she felt like she, she belonged. She found a family she belonged with. And the contrast of that with mm -hmm. young people joining <clears throat> gangs, thinking that's a family, needs to be pushed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, please talk to me about Count on Me project that just been launched. What? Okay. Is, well, that, 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 as you know, we launched at the dinner that we were privileged to have at, at Windsor, Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle, yes. And um, it hasn't. It, so the launch then was telling many of our assistants, supporters, benefactors where we were going, which was starting to raise money to develop a large group of youngsters around the community who could actually be trained to give back to their own communities. So we're looking at kids from deprived communities, often, who need to, a step up the ladder to be given skills and opportunities in life. We will teach them some of might be first aid, community skills, other opportunities. We're developing, and I'll come back to that in a second. And then they are the ones that go back into their communities to help the people who are also disadvantaged in their own communities, in towns and cities throughout the country. So it's a cyclical opportunity to help the youngsters to help their own communities. So like I say we launched the bid to raise the money to get it going in July last year. Mm -hmm. We haven't formally launched the program because we're in the stage of developing and building it based upon the funds that we're raising to take that entirely new initiative forward. It's just a part of a number of a range of initiatives that we have 
to help youngsters in our communities and in that return to help society and communities themselves. Fantastic. I can't believe how much the time is gone. I need, finally, please, could you share um, a word of advice, word of wisdom for young people today from all your experience with them? Well, um, um, how, how humbling for me to be invited to do so. Um, there's lots of wisdom one can think you impart. What do people want to hear? Well, my own attitude to life is um, grabbing the opportunities that arise. It sound like an opportunist is, is supposed to be a rather derogatory term. You take opportunity no, it's out. Not. It's Sometimes nature. people think out, out of mischief, but I do think that you never know what's around the corner. Exactly. I've been privileged to have an extraordinary complex and varied life in the military, in medicine, working overseas in Qatar, working with St John, lots of opportunities. But it's been about seeing what comes around next and thinking, hmm, And doing your best when you get me. it. And once you do it, give it your best. Absolutely. Lionel, thank you so much. I, you know, it's, it's wonderful to just chat with you about all the things you've been doing about St John. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting us in your office. And if you don't mind, we will just take some photographs and show some things. Thanks, well, yeah. Thank you. you. God bless Thank you. You. you know, and I'm going to, next time I'm going to interview your lovely wife, Penny. Yes. <laughs> I was going to ask you how you met, but I thought, no, I'm going to get that from Penny. Ah. Because I know I'm only going to get jokes from you. Tell me some serious stuff. She, she is a major part of my life. Of course she is. She's your soulmate. We're extraordinarily fortunate couples and she of course is a, we are, as you know, multi-talented herself. Oh and, she is, uh, I know. You, she keeps you on your toes, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I know she does. You, you watch, you watch, don't you? <laughs> I do, I do and I observe. Lionel, thank you so much. God bless you. Thanks, so good you. to know you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.